All right, we are live. Thanks for joining us for another, um, oh crap, it's talking at 12. <laughs> or knowledge at noon is the other one that I'm going with. We'll see which one catches on. Today I'm joined by Dr. Dr. Carmen Lemoyne, our assistant professor of flute, um, and as well as teaching oral skills, um, and just being an awesome faculty member all around. So. Um, <laughs> you do well. And today we are talking about the two and a half-ish months between when school ends and ended and when school starts and how we can actually make our summer productive. So I guess yeah. my first question, let's just talk about you for a second. Sure. What are you planning on doing this summer to... Yeah to just keep your skills going? There are a lot of things on my to-do list. Um, one definitely at the top is practicing. Um, one of the things that I have enjoyed doing, and well, there are a few things um, involving Facebook. So I have started a Keep Calm and Flute On Facebook group as nice. a way to just share uh, practice techniques or any time an amazing flute player is doing a masterclass live, we share the link to that. And mm. it's really meant for um, everybody, you know, regardless of level to stay motivated uh, mm. during this time. And, and I think it's, it's done really well. We have like 800 members or something like that. It's kind of nice. crazy. I know. Um, so I've been managing that and making videos for that. I have um, about 11 videos now about wow. just different uh, practice techniques to think about. And there's also a Keep Calm and Flute On YouTube channel, which if you're a flutist out there, go ahead and subscribe to. Nice. Put my little plug in. I'm just going to um, put a plug in. Even if you're not a flutist, you should subscribe because I think instrumentalists and uh, singers in general can learn a lot from the way that other instruments interact with their instrument. Well, I think they might just see how crazy flute players are. <laughs> I mean, there's that too. But um, there's also this really great um, Facebook group that I think has um, other instrumentalists have copied and that's called Etude of the Week. And oh. each week the moderator, um, well, we choose a certain collection to do and then each week it's the next Etude. And the idea is to, um, regardless of where you are in the etude, how polished or not polished it is, you videotape yourself and then you post it. And it's a really supportive atmosphere. And awesome. you, you see a wide range of talents and abilities there as well. So that's actually on my to-do list is um, to keep up with the etude of the week and keep practicing. And um, that's one, I think really great thing that has come out of this time being at home is that I've actually practiced more. Um, yeah. It's been really great. I love that. It, it makes me feel like I'm back in school again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your practice routine over the summer. Yeah. Um, how many, I, and you know, you're a super awesome professional. So how many hours a day, not, you know, in a block all at one time, but how many hours a day do you think you are going to try to practice? Well, I mean, yeah, you're totally right. Never practice all in one go. Um, you know, I had a, a professor tell me once an hour of practice is about 45 minutes of actual practice. And then 15 minutes lying on the floor <laughs> or just doing something. <laughs> Yeah, because the, there's a point of diminishing returns. The brain can only take so much. And then right. um, the more you practice, you're not really um, learning anything. So, I mean, ideally, oh, my gosh. Well, when I was in school, when I was an undergrad, the goal was four hours a day. Um, I don't think I've gotten close to that in a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, so with the summer and all of my, you know, teaching plans and travel plans having been canceled, I would like to aim for three hours a day, um, total, yeah. you know, um, uh, in the chat, our good friend Chastity, 
um, Pawlowski, I'm not sure if I've, I'm yeah. bad with last names. Uh, she's recommending maybe eight to nine hours a day is a suggestion. <laughs> um, you know, I, I will also, here's a helpful practice tip for those of you who are, um, I, when I was in, in school practicing, I had such anxiety about the clock. Like it just felt so daunting to be like, okay, I've got to practice for an hour without stopping or I've got, and so what I used to do is instead of looking at a clock, I mean, I checked in when I, I'd walk in there, but I used to bring these giant, can't see it, giant bottles of water, like the ones that were like, you know, I don't know, a foot tall. Like and those crazy European bottles. <laughs> yeah. And I wouldn't leave the practice room until I had finished the bottle of water. Oh, so wow. I was measuring my time by how many bottles of water, like, so it was a way for me to um, sort of not have to worry about how much, like the time that I was putting in, but, and there were certain days where it's like, I just don't want to be done with this. And so I was chugging water. <laughs> and there were other days how where I was. For you. That was your mark. Yeah. How hydrated. <laughs> That's right. How hydrated I am. But it was a good way to, like, it, it was a way of measuring the time of practice that I wasn't like feeling anxious about oh, did I practice already for an hour? Or, you know, it's it just another yeah. way that I thought about practicing. There are a lot of ways to approach it. I mean, if, well, oh, it's right here. I made a um, bi-daily practice sheet and it looks like this. Woo -woo -woo. It's available on my website, carmenlemoyne.com. <laughs> but on it, it's actually, um, you know, I have like a day one schedule and a day two. So it's like a A day and a B day. And on it, you know, you can just decide arbitrarily, I want to spend 15 minutes on tone, I want to do 20 minutes on scales, you know, and so on. Yeah. And then once you've checked off those, you're done, you know, yeah. and, and who cares how long you spent as long as you um, feel good about what you accomplished, you know. Um, and because I think certainly, it can feel really overwhelming, feeling like, oh my gosh, I have to make it to X amount of minutes. And I don't feel like practicing X amount of minutes, you know? Right. So um, I think also a really important thing is to mix it up. You know, for flutists, yeah. we have long tones and it's usually, you know, these long tones that are, we go down chromatically and, and after a while they can feel really stale. And so it's important to um, you know, when you feel that happening to move on to something else and, and just, right. you know, keep it, make sure that you are interested in practicing. That's a great, I have a confession. So my practice habits now, I have a whiteboard that I like have a list of things that I need to accomplish. Like I, I sort of focus, um, every day I need to go through the, that list, but it's sort of consistent for the week. And it, and right. when you released your little thing, I went, oh, that's so much better. And I, I went and downloaded my own copy and I'm using oh, it. Good. So awesome. uh, it's, a, it's a useful a useful practice tool. Yeah. So um, let's talk about students who are, have either are getting ready to come to WSU. So a prospective right. student. And heck, let's not even talk about it. It's a prospective music student who's getting ready to go to any school of music but yeah. probably should be coming to Wichita State. Absolutely. What, what advice do you have for them specifically that they should be doing between that, you know, their senior year of high school done and now they're getting ready for that first year of college as a music major. What's some advice you might give to that student? Right. Well, of course, when you told me that I would be doing this topic with you, you know, I thought back to what I had wished I had done or known and, um, you know, I don't recommend doing what I did, which I'll tell you about later. <laughs> um, but I, I do think, you know, keeping your chops up is important. Yeah. Um, I know that there will be days when you just don't feel like doing that. You don't feel like practicing and that's totally fine. Um, you know, some people, when they feel like that, they'll say, okay, you know, set the timer on your phone for 10 minutes. When the timer goes off, they're done. They've satisfied that practice requirement for the day. And then the next day they come back and they're more ready for it. Um, but if you can just um, keep, 
keep the instrument in the hands, in the mouth, in the voice, etc. Yeah. Um, another thing that I am recommending to my to my own students now is um, since we might, you know, be restricted in our movements, this would be a great time to make a website, actually. So, oh, sure. Yeah. Um, of course, there are a lot of um, websites online that help you make your own website. It's pretty um, user friendly. Um, I've been recommending Wix to my students, wix.com, and a, web a professional website does not need to be very fancy. It just needs to be clean and simple. And, um, you know, if you're stuck at home, like, do this is something that you can do that will help you definitely in the future. Um, even if you are just 17 or 18 years old, um, yeah. it is expected to, you're expected to have a website at some point in the near future as a musician, um, you need people to be able to easily find you. So I think that's something, if you're not feeling the practice time, the instrument time, then go let your creative um, juices flow towards a website. And, um, and all you really need is like a little bio paragraph. If you have recordings, you can easily put those on either audio or video and a contact form you know yeah there's your basic website um and most graduating seniors do have those senior pictures right now those nice pictures some with their instrument and whatnot so you might as well put those to continued use um so i think that's a really great thing to think about it's never too early absolutely that's good advice you don't want to find yourself in six years after your master's, you know, where you really are going out into the real world and, oh my gosh, I don't have a website. How do I do this? Right. You know? um, yeah. So I think that's really important. Um, another thing, being an oral skills teacher, I cannot stress enough. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you for saying it so I didn't have to, but go on. I, if you are terrified of singing, like, you maybe start humming your scales or singing some of your pieces just on a neutral syllable like la or ba. Um, get used to hearing and using the sound of your own voice. Um, you will be that much more comfortable in the oral skills class. Um, I personally hated oral skills when I was in school. I hated it so much. <laughs> And so it's interesting that I find myself now teaching it. And I think actually the fact that I didn't like it um, makes me more sympathetic to my students. And I really try and create a, um, a supportive environment for the yeah. student that I, and let them know that I understand that it's scary, um, but that it's all worth it. It's absolutely worth it to um, tackle the oral skills, the ear training, as well as the theory. Um, so often some of the students come in, they're like, oh, I've taken AP music theory and really it's just the written theory part. They haven't exercised their ear very much. And right. so it's a little unbalanced. So if, if, you, if a student out there finds themselves in that situation, you, you really need to start um, focusing on, you know, using your ear and it's as simple as singing scales every day or singing your own music, just getting used to hearing yourself sing. Yeah. yeah. I want to just add a couple of things to that. One is um, our prospective students or students who are, you know, um, getting ready to come in the, the fall should know that there's a diagnostic theory exam that we're doing online. Um, you should have gotten an email about that. So um, go ahead and take it, learn from it. But I would also just give a plug to two other things that I'm, I'm talking to people about. Um, and thinking back to my days as a student, I'm just thinking about what would I have done as well? Um, you know, one of the, I mean, some of these weren't an option because the technology wasn't there, but like there's so many websites right now right. that let you practice theory and oral skills for free. Yes. And, it, and, you know, I think one of the things that we, maybe it's just me, wrongly assume is that like 
oh, if I'm going to try to learn a new skill, then I got to put like eight hours a day into it. But, you know, look, just 10 minutes. If you just made it, like, right. if you go to a website like musictheory.net or yeah. tuaria.com um, and just said, you know what, for 10 minutes, I'm going to practice RL skills or I'm going to practice some written theory drills. And if you just do that 10 minutes a day for the next, you know, two months, yeah. you would have put in, you know, a yeah. lot of a lot of minutes <laughs> um, right. and you're so you're just that much more prepared when you yeah. come into the classroom and um yeah it's you're just ahead of the game and that's always a good feeling the other thing that i would advise is um doing taking a part of your day every day and doing some dedicated active listening Mm. you know listen to music that um is in line with the kind of career that you want to have I think you know and and obviously like and and everything else too but you know if you're going in and you're like you know I know that I want to be a music education major my dream is to be a high school orchestra teacher spend every day listening to some high school orchestra music in repertoire if you know you want to be a member of, a, of, of an orchestra, you know, spend every day and listen to and actively listen to that orchestral work. Um, I think it's it, it, this is the time. I think that's one of the hardest things for me right now in my life is setting aside time to actually sit down and actively listen to music with nothing else going on. Right. Yeah. Well, certainly, um, you know, if you go for a walk because you've been at home all day, yeah. you take your phone with you and your headphones and, you know, find on. I mean, there's so many ways to, to listen to the music online now for free. So yeah. there's really there's so much out there. There's so much out there. And it, I think it certainly doesn't have to be just, you know, quote unquote, classical music. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, Spotify has some some great tools to to get you exploring, you know, world music, African music, South American yeah. music, and all that stuff, which is yeah. going to help you in in your studies. Yeah, they've got these great Discover playlists. And yeah. like, absolutely. Um, here's my quarantine joke that I saw. Okay. And I, I say this as a fan of this band. But someone posted a meme somewhere. It's like, I can't believe this quarantine has lasted as long as a Grateful Dead song. <laughs> and I'm a fan of the Grateful Dead, so. Um, yeah. So I think there's, what about um, a student, what, what about preparing for ensemble auditions? Um, what kind of recommendations, or even if, uh, maybe we could break down the practicing that they're doing. So we talked a little bit about like long tones and scales. Right. Um, are there other are there some specific things you think they should be practicing to get ready for their first year of music college? Um, well, I think along the lines of what you just said in terms of listening, um, be on the watch for some pieces that you want to study. Right. Mm. Um, for my incoming students, it is you know we do the fundamentals with scales and etudes, but you know, um, it's really great if a student comes in with a list of repertoire that they're already super excited about and and we can talk about which pieces um, would be great for them to work on that semester. Um, I mean, I'm very happy to assign a listening assignment for my students, but if you're doing it, then, you know, that makes my job a little easier. And right. I know that and I know that you're going to enjoy learning that piece so i think um you know having some ideas in mind about um what what you want to learn what excites you about the music for your instrument or voice um in regards to the ensemble auditions um i don't know if they've posted the excerpts yet do you know uh not yet but those will be coming up sometime soon yeah, i'm sure it's a little early um for them to be posted but you we're just recovering right. <laughs> we're all just trying to sleep right now That's right. <laughs> like, catch up on some sleep um so usually there are scales um and there are pre-chosen orchestral pieces or 
I know for flute it's been an etude and um, and then I think some sight reading if I remember correctly. So, you know, um, and that's a great way to just divvy up your practice anyways, you know, do your tone work. I'm, I can only speak for flute. Yeah. <laughs> your tone work, um, scales and etudes. If you've never studied an etude or you don't know what it is, um, contact me. I'll be happy to, to let you in on that. An etude is basically a short technical study um, that you're supposed to be able to get through them about one one every week or one every two weeks and if you're finding yourself spending more time on them then they're too hard so yeah. you need to find a, an easier etude um and they're great they're wonderful um ways to learn uh, our technique better and then you go on to your repertoire and so um you know be listening to repertoire and once those audition excerpts come out you know, be, be practicing those. Um, yeah. I will say, you know, I mean, I teach high school students as well. And um, the thing when you play, when you do an audition and, you know, maybe you don't do a lot of them yet. <laughs> yeah. um, there are some things um, that you can just bet that the other person is listening for um and that's rhythm right um the quality of sound and intonation so how well in tune are you um so if you have those three things covered then you're gonna have a successful audition um but rhythm i i feel like i really have to be very hard on my students about rhythm it's like you cannot be sloppy about rhythm i'm sorry yeah. If you're sloppy about rhythm that you just you're not going to be able to get a job later you have to be really good at rhythm so if you feel like you need work in this area well that should be a big um at the top of your to-do list i would say in your practicing is you know really nailing down what a dotted eighth sixteenth note sounds like at a fast tempo and at a slow tempo um because you're gonna see that a lot coming up and so yeah rhythm is a big one where i see some um in 17 and 18 year olds just that's a that's an area that needs to yeah. be addressed often i would offer um some further advice on that going back to my college days um number one is there's this awesome tool that will help you greatly with rhythm called a metronome and <laughs> Everyone should own one. You can even get them for your phone. Um, so always, you know, always be practicing with your metronome. And, and in fact, I had a teacher in college. She was, I love Diane Maltester. If she's watching this, shout out to Diane Maltester. She's the, um, do you know Diane? Did you that know her at all? That sounds really familiar. I probably she, played with her somewhere. Yeah, she principal clarinet of the Oakland uh, East Bay okay. Symphony, but also would play um, subbed in lots of different things in Big San around, Francisco yeah. Opera. Yeah, um, she did a master class for well, that was once all about a metronome, and like it was a whole master class on how to use the metronome. So she would do things like um, she would, you know, obviously like the click on every beat. But then she would have it like click every downbeat, you know, and just, you know, and just make sure she could line up her down, you know, beat one. Right. And then so sometimes she would, uh, or beat three or beat like a random beat within it. Yeah. Or sometimes she would turn the metronome around and so somebody else could watch it and, oh. you know, and then like try to line up a random beat. So she had all these different ways of practicing with the metronome jazz musicians and you know it's not a bad idea for classical but putting the metronome on two and four um right. you know it's such a that's such a it was like a mind-blowing breakthrough the other thing that i did for rhythm was i bought a uh, a book of snare drum etudes oh, okay. and would practice the snare drum etudes on bass right. on a single note and then eventually right. with a scale and then with an arpeggio and then random pitches but in rhythm Right. And so all these different ways of trying to embed, uh, you know, I, I sort of would, um, in a way it becomes like perfect pitch, like it's a perfect rhythm. Like you see a rhythm, you automatically can right. audiate it in your head. You know what it feels like, you know what it sounds like. So 
what's nice about the um uh what's nice about the the snare drum um etudes is that they've got no um pitch com connected to them right. so you can practice it, your rhythm in so many ways even if it's just clapping um, right well and the, and that's a great place to start actually is clapping or tapping yeah. so without the instrument you're embodying you know the the inner pulse and all of that so there's a couple of comments in the chat that I want to get to. Not questions, but just other words of advice. Um, Amani Mosley, uh, our musicology professor, but also a, a quite fantastic bassoonist, yeah. um, wrote her favorite thing to do with a metronome uh, when working on a passage is to keep it on even when you're not playing, like taking a breather, drinking water, oh, so wow. that pulse just becomes <laughs> embodied. Um, Marsha Hatfield would love a video on metronome use to share with my students. I think it's a good idea. Absolutely. I yeah. will share, um, I like to put it on the offbeats. Ooh. I know, that one's a little nuts, trying to get in to, to shift that. Yeah. To thinking it's on the offbeat, like a polka or, or you yeah, know, yeah. ska. Like a march or ska, <laughs> yeah. Um, Chastity also made a great uh, comment about um, your practice time about sight reading. And she even says, yeah. goes a little farther, sight reading musically. Yeah. Um, well, and I, and that, that has to do with oral skills too. Right. You know, like if, you know, I certainly didn't know. I remember having a teacher who tried to explain secondary dominance to me in high school. <laughs> And I remember it just going completely over my head um, at the time, you know, but of course now I understand. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, so it's, yeah, it's true, but you can still, even if you don't have that theoretical knowledge, you know, you can, you know, if there's a scale going up. Yeah. Crescendo, yeah. or if there's a scale going down, you know, doing, really experimenting with these musical ideas um as well as getting all of the other requirements that right. are very um objective right yeah like rhythm rhythm is very objective um intonation is pretty objective <laughs> uh, <laughs> depends on who you're playing with right yeah. um and but the the artistry the musicianship that is what i think is the most fun part about yeah. being a musician is experimenting with what if I, you know, slow down here, even though it doesn't say to you, what if I do that, what happens? And then what do I have to do on the other side of the retard to, to make it make sense? And so, um, but you know, that's, that's something that we can do in the lessons once they're at WSU or right. college. Do you have recommendations for, from a tech, from a performance, like on your instrument, if I was gonna do some sight reading, um, if I wanted to make sight reading a part of my practice mm -hmm. um, routine, how do I pick good? First off, what do I? How do I pick good music to sight read? Right. Um, and secondly, what's the difference between sight reading and practicing? Well, I think sight reading is like a subset, almost. You know. Okay. Sorry, I should be. I was fishing for an answer. Uh, I'll just tell you what I was thinking with with sight reading specifically it's it's about not stopping right it's about you know it's not going back and fixing something right it's yeah. a, it's it's the the technique of sight reading is about starting at the left and getting to the right and right. fumbling along the way but right. being able to pick and up recovering. Yeah, yeah absolutely so um, sorry I was trying to <laughs> fish right but what about finding repertoire to sight so, read yeah um i think talking about etudes um like for flute we've got a great website called flutetunes.com and they have a ton of etudes um that you know of all levels so if you are at a high school level you know um, you're not going to sight read something that you would take a week to, to right. work on. You're going to bump a few levels down and try and sight read something that you would have prepared maybe in ninth grade, eighth grade, and, and see how you do there. And, and if, if you aren't able to really sight read well there, you know, no shame. Just bump it down a few le more levels, you yeah. know, because it's just, 
you know, with music, it just takes um, time, patience, and intelligent work, which is a, a quote from one of our um, great pedagogues, Trevor Y. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of time, patience, and intelligent work. And if you have that in mind, then you're going to be able to eventually play anything, I think. I, so always I, liked I would it. go to etudes. I would, um, you know, maybe like some Baroque sonatas um, are fairly straightforward rhythmically. Yeah. Um, of course, they're, um, they're not always super easy, you know, to create the finished product. Um, but if you're just sight reading, that's a possibility. I um I would also put out a plug for um, some easy short sight reading um, is getting a real book, a jazz real book, and oh, reading yeah. the melodies out of there. And it's a fun way you know, if you're a quote unquote classical musician to start learning some you know jazz um, kind of stuff. Um, and they're usually the melodies in a real book are usually incredibly sight readable. Right. They're very melodic. So and because they don't have dynamics or articulations, like you can even try like sight reading it in different ways. You know, um, I'm going to do it all staccato. I'll do it all legato. I'll you know I'll experiment with some different phrasing. Um, yeah, I I have to say, I mean. When, sometimes when I think about my own practice, I, I get overwhelmed by it. Um, there are so many method books out there that address like vibrato, that address like only vibrato, right? You know, only articulation, and and it. So for me, sometimes that feels a little overwhelming. Um, you know, somebody comes up with a, a new scale exercise and then they publish it and then flutists go crazy. Like they gotta, you know, I gotta learn it. And <laughs> I just, I, I think, you know, there's, you don't have to wait for anybody else to do this, mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. these exercises. You know, you as a 16, 17 year old, 18 year old are, completely welcome to come up with your own exercises. You don't always, you know, have to stick to the rules in this way. And, you know, we'll put that in yeah. terms. Um, in fact, you know, that's one way we can exercise our creative muscle. If you have, you know, if you're working on double tonguing, for instance, on flute, you know, take, take, um, a scale pattern and, and figure out a way to work on your articulation with that. You know, it just, you don't need to have somebody write it out for you. Just figure, you know, come up with something on your own. And for me, that's way more interesting, I think. Another shout out to Diane Maltester. She would, one of our um, assignments would be if there was a technical thing in your music you were struggling with, like a trill for, you know, clarinetist trills, always trills. Right. Um, so she would make her students write etudes based nice. on the trill that they were having trouble with. So they'd have to write their own etudes. That and again, it's nice. it's a nice way to be creative and, and break up the sort of monotony. And at the end of the day, you create something that's going to make you better at this thing that you were working on. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Um, we're about out of time, so I want to ask one last question. Okay. Um, before you do, Marsha Hatfield asks, do they make real books in alto clef? You know, <laughs> they should, and they should make them in tenor clef too, but <laughs> yeah, but write your own. That's right. Um, I mean, you can sell it to all the violists. They'll buy it in the RB. <laughs> um, so my, my last question, Carmen, for you is, and it's something that I think a lot of us have been thinking about. You know, we're in this weird time of COVID-19. A lot of concerts have been canceled and whole groups are canceling their, their, their 2021 season already. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just feels so, it can feel like, why should I even keep making my art if there's nothing there and so i'm just wondering a is that something that has occurred like has that have you had that feeling yet or uh and if and if so what have you done to mitigate that and if not you know what advice might you give to somebody who's just kind of like i can't even find the motivation to do anything right now because yeah. who knows what the industry is going to look like 
Well, yeah, I a lot of things are coming to mind. Um, I'm going to, out in public, on Facebook, I'm going to confess something um, that I do not recommend people do. Okay. <laughs> um, pretty much almost every summer between my senior year and I would say my junior year of college, I did not touch my flute in the summers. Mm. Which I don't recommend at all. <laughs> because, you know, you take four summers and that's four times three months. I just lost a year of practicing. And so I don't recommend that. Um, but I did it because I was so burnt out. I just, like, did not want... I did not feel like playing the flute at all. And I'd come back in the fall and... You know, I, my chops were rusty, my lips, but, you know, they, they came back, and um, luckily. So there is that, like, mental health aspect of, ta you know, just being aware, is, is my heart in this? Is my brain in this? Because if it's not, then don't practice. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um... One thing I did do during this, you know, between mid-March to now, um, there were days when I did not feel like practicing, and I, I, I have an iPhone, so I did download acapella, and I, you know, recorded duets with myself, and instead of practicing, yeah. and that to me was like super fun. I hadn't done that since I was like in the sixth grade, you know, and had a cassette player and recorded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And for me, that was really great. And, and that, that really helped me spark um, some more joy. Oh my gosh, yeah. I said that. Um, <laughs> All right, Marie Kondo. I know. Um, <laughs> but to be honest, I mean, there have definitely been moments in my life, and not just now, where I have thought, you know, I'm not, I'm not finding enjoyment in this. Mm -hmm. and um and yeah that's that's kind of a scary place to be in um but for whatever reason i kept at it and um in the past two months or so i have to say i i, I have not felt like what's the point yeah um in fact i have i don't know why i i feel like there's more urgency i have i have yeah there's more urgency for me to play music and to learn it all of a sudden yeah. i feel like i want to learn all this repertoire i've got all this space in my life now right um and i want to do you know i want to learn these pieces or i want to improve something and um which i you know considering how i used to feel you know being completely burnt out on it is actually a little surprising to me. Um, I mean, of course, I love to play the flute and I love being a musician, but um, it's not completely who I am. Right. You know, and, it, and it, I don't think it should be. Um, so if you are struggling with finding that motivation, I think that is totally normal. <laughs> and what I have found in myself when I have those days where I don't feel motivated to do anything, um, I let myself do nothing. I will take a day to do nothing, to give myself permission to just do whatever I want, uh, you know, watch movies all day if I want to, stay inside all day if I want to, sleep, you know, and then inevitably the next day I do feel better. I feel yeah. ready and refreshed to um, take on my to-do list or whatever. There's something about giving the mind that space um, to re recuperate. Um, and in this case, I mean, it might take more than one day um, to, to, to feel, you know, some um, direction again. And I think that's okay. Um, so, you know, if, if practicing scales feels like a chore, 
Like, that's okay. You know, maybe try practicing your sight reading um, yeah. or experiment with acapella or work on your website. Um, there are a lot of things that you can still do that will um, help you out later, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I would just sort of raise up a little bit from what you're saying, I think is really important. So one is this idea of like, everyone needs rest. Yeah. So take some rest. You know, I, I think about it from like um, endurance athletes, you know, yeah. endur who are building up these long term, like they still take a rest day every week. They don't do any exercise, right? Like, so there's something to be said about just rest and, and um, you know, practicing being practicing with bitterness usually doesn't re lead to very productive practicing. No. I also think the other thing that you're highlighting that's really important is this idea of finding things that are creative and connected to what you do, but aren't just playing your instrument. So that, yeah, if, if right now it just feels so overwhelming to imagine being a, um, you know, practicing in, in learning this repertoire, maybe it's you shift your focus for a few days to listening, or you shift your focus for a few, a few days to like trying a new style of music. Or I know for me, um, it's been, you know, because of the, my, my position, it's really hard for me to have time to compose original music. So one of the things that I've been doing is spending more time arranging. Nice. You know, yeah. and like, and that just sort of working that muscle. So I feel like I'm still engaged in something creative yeah. and I don't have the pressure of, you know, writing some brand new idea. Um, yeah. And yeah. so it's, it's finding those things that I think are connected to your creativity that aren't necessarily have to be specific, but knowing that you will have to come back <laughs> to that primary thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, studying a musical instrument um does take discipline right um and i think each one of us is capable of doing that obviously otherwise we wouldn't have reached this level um but you but yeah you you have to feel ready for that I yeah think. yeah awesome. and of course coming out of the past two months it's gonna be challenging i think for a lot of people yeah so. but you know this too shall pass yep keep calm carry on that's right Hold my on. daughters all they want they said i just want to be able to like go hug my friends again oh, and I know. like we'll get there i but know they can hug you <laughs> yes they can anytime they want uh all right well thank you so much for your time yeah, and uh and, you know, for those of you watching, thanks for checking in. So next, I'm going to give a quick plug for next next week's Talking at Tuesday. Um, talk, talking at 12, sorry. On Tuesday, uh, we're going to do a uh, session with our instrumental directors, um, Tim Shade and Mark Laycock, director of bands and director of orchestra. And potentially we will also be joined by uh, Catherine Concilio, who uh, does a lot of our chamber music program. So tune in on Tuesday for that. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Lemoyne. And we yeah. will have a good um, uh, weekend, a Memorial Day weekend. And we'll see you yep. all soon. Thanks to all, all right. of you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.